Trigger warning, this episode briefly describes acts of torture. The year is 415 CE, Alexandria, Egypt. Constantine made Christianity Rome's official religion less than 100 years ago, and the remnants of the world's most powerful empire spanning over a thousand years. Hundreds of generations of small humans living their lives, loving, dying, hoping, praying, fighting, learning, losing, will collapse in just 61 years, less than a lifetime today. Constantine outlawed magic and divination, commonly known over 1600 years from now as astronomy, for all except himself. That outlaw of science directly affects today, a seemingly normal day in Alexandria, Egypt, in March 415. Today, Christianity snuffs out the last candlelight of Greek philosophy and education. Today, the Western world plunges into darkness for the next thousand years. Today, Hypatia of Alexandria dies. Welcome to Small Anthropoids. Hypatia's writings, her voice, was destroyed when she was. However, that does not mean we cannot tell her story. The first recorded female astronomer and mathematician was born into the Roman elite in 355. Educated by her famed mathematician father, Hypatia rose like the other select, but no doubt pivotal daughters of the time, carrying the legacy of their family in the lack of sons and achieving remarkable recognition in the arts and sciences. Although her sex irritated her growing Christian adversaries, who focused on restricting women's power, the men in her field respected her. Socrates Scholasticus, having lived during her time, wrote she did not quote, feel abashed in going to an assembly of men, for all men on account of her extraordinary dignity and virtue admired her the more, end quote. In other words, powerful men came to her for counsel, and her advice was respected and implemented. Although some may argue that Hypatia's mere existence as the first female astronomer and mathematician is enough to merit historical significance in its own right, ultimately, Hypatia was not remarkable merely because of the intersection between her work and sex. It was because her work eclipsed all others in her time. Around 400, she became the head of the Platonist school in Alexandria. Her students, all wealthy young men, were sent from the furthest parts of the empire to receive the best education money could buy. Hypatia, like Alexandria, did not discriminate between pagans and Christians. Because she considered herself to be a classical philosopher, she was technically pagan, but took a more tolerant and transcendent view of spirituality, inviting students to contemplate the nature of reality through their own devices, not through indoctrination. As a result, she made friends and allies in both sides of the religious struggle. According to historian Soraya Field Fiorio, the, quote, greatest achievement of Hypatia and her school in Alexandria was not introducing new ideas, but carrying the flame of philosophical inquiry into an increasingly darkening age." End quote. While Christian zealots were destroying temples and books that went against Christian dogma, Hypatia was writing treatises critiquing, honing, and clarifying the mathematicians like Euclid and Ptolemy, making them more digestible for the average reader. After all, if genius cannot be understood, what purpose does it serve? Hypatia understood this, and as a result, her works were widely popular. In addition to mathematics, she was an inventor, designing the first hydroscope, an early telescope, an astrolabe, a device used to tell time via the stars and planets, as well as a more efficient method of long division. According to expert Field Fiorio, Mathematics to Hypatia was not a hard science, but rather the sacred language of the universe. Expanding upon Pythagoras, she taught that the cosmos is numerically ordered, with the planets moving in orbits corresponding to musical intervals and creating harmonies in space. 
quote, the music of the spheres. In those times, the difference between mathematics and magic, astronomy and astrology, was a fine line to understand, and even more difficult to understand by those who refused to try. Hypatia's associations with the stars was enough for church leaders jealous of her following to accuse her of sorcery. Enter Cyril and the Parabolanes. After Alexandria's priest died, the title was passed to Orestes, a moderate Christian and friend to Hypatia. Cyril, a power-hungry and violently extreme Christian bishop, felt Orestes not Christian enough to govern the city. After a series of squabbles, including Cyril expelling the Jewish population without Orestes' approval and a violent attack on Orestes while driving his chariot through the city, Cyril's popularity only began to sink, while the peaceful, accepting intellectuals like the moderate Christian Orestes and pagan Hypatia, well, their popularity only continued to grow. The feud escalated, and the Parabolanes, the Christian group vowing to aid the dead and dying, but were essentially terrorists, became more intertwined with Cyril's cause. That brings us to today, March 415. At this point in time, Hypatia has reached her peak popularity. She sided with the Jewish population, advocated for acceptance and civil discourse in lieu of violence. She regularly hosted and advised powerful allies from all over the empire, including Orestes, and had a slew of civic honors. In contrast, according to Fields Fiorio, Cyril was unwanted and disliked. From there, according to the Pseudo-Lexicon, a Byzantine encyclopedia, Cyril was, quote, so struck with envy against Hypatia that he immediately began plotting her murder and the most heinous form of murder at that, end quote. He incited rumors that, because of Hypatia's connections with the stars and her inventions, that she was a sorceress guilty of bewitching Orestes. As you'll recall, Magic was a big no-no, thanks to Constantine a hundred years earlier, who, by the way, said it was still legal for himself and only converted to Christianity when the priests of the Roman gods would not erase his so-called sins of murdering his son and boiling his wife to death in her bathtub. But I digress. The Parabolani received word of this rumor, essentially that Hypatia had ideas that made people feel small or unimportant. Therefore, they were magic. That was scary. The rest is history. Hypatia was riding her chariot through the spring streets of Alexandria. She is 45, at a time when the average lifespan was 10 years younger, an older woman in comparison. The Parabolanis pull the teacher from her chariot. They drag her to a temple. She was stripped naked, her skin flayed with jagged pieces of oyster shells, her limbs pulled from her body and paraded through the streets. If she was still alive at this point, we do not know, but the rest of her was burned in a mockery of pagan sacrifice. Cyril became canonized as a saint. Hypatia was thrust into oblivion for the next 14,000 years. The year is 2024. Hypatia is an icon. Not only have a number of books, artwork, movie, and media been made to share her story, there is also an asteroid named after her, a crater on the moon in the Sea of Tranquility near where Apollo 11 landed, a journal of feminist studies, but what I think she would be most proud of 
are the hundreds of thousands of dollars of Hypatia scholarships given out annually to young women pursuing STEM. The future is bright. Although not much is known about Hypatia, her message of striving for intellectual excellence that places an emphasis on curiosity and contemplation in lieu of fear and rejection will inspire from now until the dusk of humanity here on Earth. The next time you are out watching the night sky, check out the moon diagram on the cover. It will show you the approximate location to find Hypatia's crater with the naked eye. That's it for today, folks. We hope any feelings of small were not scary. Next week, we finish up Galileo's Starry Messenger. If you enjoyed, please like, subscribe, and share with friends. I'm Abby. My inspo behind the scenes is Bethany. Stay curious and take care, small anthropoids. <laughs>